hey, I'm not late, I'm right here. Hello everyone, uh, as you can see, I am not on the Because Science stage, but I am in a hotel room because I'm traveling for work, but I wanted to start this live stream just for you, just for everyone uh, who is watching, because I wanna answer all the questions that you have about the new channel and everything that we're gonna do on the new channel. Uh, going forward, the live streams aren't quite gonna be like this. We are gonna be doing it on stage, on set, and I'm gonna be trying to take your questions live. Hello to everyone, especially my fellow uh, coworkers and colleagues who are waiting for me to do the first thing. So, uh, as we go forward, the first live stream will be a little bit different. I'll be trying to take your questions live, but because I was unfortunately traveling during the first full week of content, I am here in a hotel room uh, taking your question. Yes, this did just begin. Uh, Roberto asks, how do you write backwards? Oh, no secrets, no secrets just yet. That might be, uh, a lot of you have asked for a behind the scenes video and I will get to that soon. Speaking of getting to things soon, we just hit 100,000 subscribers today on Because Science, the new channel. That's, it's amazing, really. When I think about it, we started this show almost four years ago and I knew there was a large audience out there because of how everyone was watching, but it is, it is honestly humbling to see how many people have come and uh, joined the new channel and watched and supported, and uh, I hope you like the new vlog format. Uh, I think it's fun. I want to try to build our little world that way by uh, answering for my incorrections when I have them, and they are many, and uh, having a dialogue with everyone here. So if you have any questions for me, I'll be sitting here in an undisclosed location for the next little while. So. Uh, Hit me up. Uh, let's see, let's see. We, Billy Bob says, what do I prefer more, Marvel or DC? Um, right now, I'm a, I'm a Marvel man. They just have a, they have a lineup that seems to be killing it, and uh, they've kind of taken over the comedy route in superhero films, whereas DC has been a little bit uh, darker, so uh, I, I like that kind of comedy. Uh, Tony McHale asks, what's your favorite field of science? Um... My background, so if you don't know, my background, my education is in civil and environmental engineering. And then uh, after that, I went to get a master's degree and my engineering professors were very confused because I went into the field of communication, science communication, instead of engineering. And they're like, don't you wanna make all the uh, petroleum engineer money? Uh, anyway, so I, I have a background in engineering, but if I had to go back and pick a different field of science based on my preference. It might honestly be rocket science or something in us in astronomy. I think rocket science is so pure. It's it's one of the coolest things that humans do, or at least one of the most visible and and awe inspiring. And I and I think I could I could get into that. I have some friends who work uh, at JPL, some uh, friends that work at SpaceX, and I know what they do, and I'm very impressed. So you know maybe I could give it a shot one day. Um, what's my favorite superpower? Is asked. I've been asked this a lot because. A lot of my show covers that, but I've, I've thought about it, and a super, pair, uh, a super pure, a superpower that I don't see a lot that I'd like to see is I want to stop time, like Rick does in an episode of Rick and Morty, but I'd like to stop time and be able to think through decisions, because a lot of times I just say things that I would like to stop, think it through, and then, uh, and then, and then proceed. Who would win an arm wrestle between the Hulk and the Juggernaut? Well, it, it depends on if his momentum powers, as I define them, apply to just moving parts of his body. Does that mean that if his arms started moving, it wouldn't stop? Or does his whole body have to start moving? You'd have to figure that that uh, that, that out first. Uh, top five books. I'll have one recommendation for you right now. I read a book not too long ago called uh, Spillover by David Quammen. And Spillover is about the emergence of infectious diseases. So it's called, uh, there's an epidemiological event called a spillover spillover when um, some virus, some, hmm, let's see, let's see, hmm, heat resistant field around a lightsaber. I get asked this a lot, especially um, because I kind of go back and forth. So I've made more lightsaber videos than anything else. And the problem is for everyone who's commenting on the Darth Vader video and the vlog saying I got it totally wrong, this is what we have to decide. Either lightsabers are hot enough to melt through blast doors or, and not cauterize anything and actually explode people, <laughs> or they're hot enough to hold 
in your hand. They're not, they're not hot enough so you can hold them in your hand. You got to go one or the other way. The, the physics just doesn't really make it possible. Even if you are containing the plasma in a magnetic field, you kind of need a vacuum between you, your hand and the field so that heat isn't transferred through the air. Um, you got to pick one. And the one that I pick, usually, if you would think about uh, a theme on this show, I'm not trying to settle nerd debates. I'm not trying to get the most correct answer. What I want to do is take an interesting question about pop, the pop culture that we love and apply some scientific principles that we know of to it to see if we can learn anything. To me, the learning process is a lot more interesting and a lot more fruitful than just saying, you know, Kirk is better than Picard or whatever with statistics. I should do that episode. Uh, Giovanni GPS, one of my favorite video games. I, uh, right now I'm playing Monster Hunter, uh, having fun. Uh, my favorite recent game, I think, um, playing through Breath of the Wild, which is a masterpiece. I really liked Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, refreshing gameplay, very fast, um, beautiful, good acting, good characters, and a refreshingly original sci-fi story. It doesn't go like you think. I I'd recommend that. Um, who else has questions about the channel? <laughs> Hey, it's new, and for everyone who joined us, uh, Because Science is now its own ecosystem. We have Because Science across Facebook. Hey, Matterbeam, we have uh, Because Science across Facebook and YouTube, where you can go and subscribe to the channel, and on Twitter and Instagram, where you can get all the updates about this show. Uh, we just crossed 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is which is amazing. We're, we're already doing, it's, it's a lot better than I thought we would do at just a week just one week, which means a lot of you were watching and we're just waiting to do this, which makes me feel really happy. Um, makes it all worth it, you know, being sunburned in a hotel room. Um, Aaron asks, why don't I draw something right now? You're, you're one of the producer, you know what? You know what? We'll leave that for behind the scenes. Uh, who else asks? Um, review of the Falcon Heavy launch. Uh, the Falcon Heavy launch was truly awe-inspiring. I think it's one of the nerdiest things that anyone has ever done, just launching the car into space with Dope Panic playing Bowie. How awesome is that? Um, but beyond that, it really is a step, it, it really is a major step towards making space more accessible to all of us. Oh, I almost slipped into Carl Sagan there for a second. It really is a step towards making space available to all humans. And when space is available to all humans, we will dip our toes in the shore of the cosmic ocean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh man. If I could only talk half as well as he did. Uh, there, they, you're right, uh, in the comments, they did miss the drone ship landing, but uh, two for three? You're still saving, um, you're, still, you're still more powerful and cheaper than all the, all the competition, so. Uh, warp drive for real. Um, I know there's there's a lot of there's a lot of theories about the Albuquerque drive and the the, uh, the drive that's supposed to get around energy requirements. EM drives. Um, right now, I haven't seen anything that's per been particularly uh, particularly convincing to me. Um, the amount of energy that you need to warp space and time itself to get around the relativity problem. Um, is just absolutely enormous. I don't see it happening anytime soon. So the relativity, the relativity problem is that when you go very, 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 very fast, close to the speed of light, um, time contracts for you. So it, it, you, you experience less time than the world around you. So if you're going really fast, um, you could age less. This is what happened in Interstellar. And, or if you're around something massive like a black hole, and that's the relativity problem. So you'd want to get around that with a warp drive. Otherwise, if you went to, uh, you know, impulse power and got 99% the speed of light in the Enterprise and then traveled to the next sector or next quadrant, when you got there, all of Starfleet would be transformed, dead, hundreds of years in the future, something different. And that would make interstellar travel impossible or not feasible to have economies and functioning governments and, and, and all of that. Um, who has more questions? Uh, I do stuff says the star Wars prequels were good. Hey, I've evolved on the star Wars prequels. If you watch them just looking to have fun, 
They're pretty fun. Do it. Um, asking me about my sexual orientation. We're going to skip over that. Uh, hello. Um, Dr. Hoover Generation. Uh, a f one of my first articles, I used to be in science writing before science hosting stuff, and uh, one of my favorite articles that I've written, which you can check out on Nerdist.com, is that you're, you're going through a Doctor Who style regeneration right now. Um, there are very few cells in your body that stay the same over time. And this gets into uh, a lot of philosophical quandaries, like, am I really the same person uh, over time, like I, like I was 10 years ago? That depends on what you mean. If you mean cellularly, not really. Um, if you mean philosophically, eh, maybe. Uh, Matterbeam asks, tell us more about how you got into the whole science gig. So, a little bit of background on me. Uh, when I was doing my engineering degree, I started just science writing because I wanted to get better at communicating science because I was really nerdy about it. Uh, so I started my own little blog, no, you know, no name blog, and I started writing for myself and challenging myself to write every day and get better at it. I was reading good writing. I was following good uh, communicators. I was, you know, watching Cosmos and, you know, actually taking notes on a notepad about how Carl Sagan spoke and what he did and what made him effective. Um, and during that time, I started pitching freelance science articles, which you can still read on scientificamerican.com. And uh, I had one article that I wrote that went bonkers, went bonkers viral. Um, it was about whether or not, and I don't know if I went back if it would be super accurate or I'd do it the same. You can be the judge of that. But I wrote an article about whether or not a certain character would die during uh, a certain movie involving the Firefly universe. Um, and I did a kind of a fanboy nerd rant about that, and it did so well, it got tweeted out by Nathan Philly, and he said it was the best fanboy rant he's ever heard about the show, so I win. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but after that, I realized that people really like the intersection of science and popular culture, so I wanted to make it my thing. I wanted to make it something that, uh, that I stood apart from other science communicators on. Uh, Cause let's be honest, there's a lot of skinny white guys talking about science on TV and the internet. So I wanted to be different, um, hence the hair. Um, so I wanted to carve out my own niche um, if I could get good at this thing. So I started writing for Scientific American. Uh, officially, they brought me on for a blog. And during that work, I was pitching freelance articles to uh, like Wired and Popular Science and the Boston Globe and, and those places. And through that and through Twitter, actually, I got offered my first on-camera gig for Al Jazeera America for a show called Techno. And um, while I was doing that show, I still have lifelong friends from that. Uh, while I was doing that show, I was coming out to LA a lot. And when I was in LA, I met some people. And one of those people's was, uh, oh, wow, I didn't even think about this. Coincidentally, Nathan Fillion's um, companion at the time. And so I went to his birthday party, and who was at the birthday party? A one Chris Hardwick. So I went up to him, and I elevator pitched him, and what I said was, uh, hey, I bet I can explain how the Walking Dead virus works. And I gave him a quick elevator pitch. He asked me if I do any on-camera stuff. I had just started doing it for Al Jazeera, and then he hired me. A um, couple weeks later, and I started at Nerdist in 2014. And look at us now. Look at, look at all the stuff we've done. It's pretty cool. And, you know, I, for everyone who's commenting and for everyone who watches and comments a lot, I do notice. I read all the comments. I get your messages. I can't respond to them all. But I feel very, very fortunate um, because I also, you know, thought to myself before, you know, why, why do I do this kind of thing? And I think I've come to the conclusion is that it's because I've been fortunate enough to have really good teachers growing up, people in my life who, science teachers in my life who have been passionate and enthusiastic and have encouraged me to be both of those things and have pushed me and pushed my curiosity. Um, and I've been very fortunate to have a good education from good teachers. So if I can be any kind of good at education or, or communication at all, I owe it to my teachers to be a good teacher if I can. And that's why I do it. If I, if I, if I can help, I should. And that's what I'm doing. I'm not going to cry. Do I edit my own material? No, I do not. Um, I have a very small team, uh, four people. I have a, uh, 
uh, a producer and a camera woman and an editor and me. So I write and research and script out all uh, everything that I say on camera. I also do. Uh, I suggest all the animations and all the jokes and all the cuts and you know should it be close or far away. Um, and I have a producer make sure I get all that right and that I'm that I'm not missing anything. Uh, a camera a camera uh, woman. And then an editor uh, named Charles, who's a rock star, who's in the who's in the comments, and he does uh, right when he got on, when, right when he was hired about a year ago, the videos took a marked jump uh, towards fantastic animation. That not to say that my previous videos didn't. It's just that Charles really puts 100 percent in, and I and I know you in the comments have noticed um, the animations have been really good lately, and we wanted we wanted them to be good. Um, we wanted them to be good, especially for the first few episodes on the new channel. Um, Aaron, my producer, asks, should you drink raw water? No, you, sh you shouldn't. That's why, you know, that's how societies exist. Clean stuff. Once, once humanity was able to deal with the vectors of disease and contamination, that's when we were able to live closer together and with more people and form large societies. Once we were dealing with our waste in a correct way and not transmitting waterborne diseases and um, that's how people could function as a society in more than, you know, more numbers than just a few hundred or a few thousand. Don't drink raw water unless you, I mean, unless you have to because you're de you find an oasis in the desert. Yeah, okay. But a daily thing, if you have access to filtered water, drink filtered water. That is an insult to science. <laughs> You might not get sick, but then again, if you do, you know you shouldn't. Tr anyway, um, how long how long can you breathe without oxygen? <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. You can be in space for about fifteen seconds before you lose consciousness. Um, so you can't go without oxygen to your brain very long at all. And remember, if you're thrown out of an airlock, don't hold your breath because the pressure differential will force the air out of your lungs and it'll rip and freeze lung tissue as it escapes. It's kind of like it's kind of like being reversed punched in the gut. You don't want that. Um, who else has? Questions. Do I do all the calculations myself or do I have help? That depends. Um, people like, uh, I've only recently contacted people like Matterbeam who are in the comments who are nerds like me who love calculating the stuff that I, that, uh, that I calculate and sometimes I need a second opinion on does this make sense or these numbers make sense or this is above my uh, pay grade so to speak in terms of my engineering background uh, because I'm not a working engineer or working scientist so I want to make sure I'm getting stuff right. But I usually, if you pay attention, I usually stick to topics that are basic. Because I'm, I'm not an expert, um, I'm not a PhD, so I don't want to talk about anything that I don't fully understand. And also, I want the show to be broad enough that it introduces basic science concepts that if you are interested, you can look into further. Or if you're a kid or if you're a family, there can be kind of an entry point into this stuff. I'm not trying to give a complete seminar or lecture about these topics because it's it's beyond me, or it would just take so long to make one episode that I can't. So I do all the calculations myself when I can, um, but they are usually pretty basic. Um, order of magnitude kind of estimation. So uh, things that we can get pretty close, ballpark of the right numbers. Um, and that's, 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 that's how I do most of it. I mean, it takes... It takes about two full weeks of time to produce one episode from beginning to publishing it out on the channel. So uh, it's a pretty tight turnaround. So even now I'm stressing out about what the next episode is gonna be. I have an idea, um, but the episodes coming up are gonna be, gonna be good. Um, oh, how long can people breathe pure oxygen? <laughs> that makes more sense. Well, I know if you hyper, if you saturate your blood with oxygen more than it otherwise would be, like David Blaine did for his stunt, you can hold your breath for 20 or 30 minutes, which is, sounds crazy, and it, it, it does. Uh, oh, I knew this question was coming. Uh, what kind of, yes, I get paid. <laughs> I don't do this for free, which is why you sometimes you have to go to a hotel, a hotel room to do uh, stuff that pays for everything. I, lo I love doing be uh, Because Science, um, and, I, and it's going to be free. 
pushing it out to you. If you want it two days earlier, can, you can subscribe to Project Alpha and get it two days earlier than anyone else for a bit more premium stuff and, and, and some other stuff that uh, Nerdist and both Geek and Sundry do. Um, but it's going to stay free. But yeah, I gotta gotta survive. Um, what conditioner do you use? I use Alita. I don't know if it's a local brand, but I buy it. It's called E L I T A. Use Alita. A lot of argan oil, and I have good genes. Thanks, mom. If you're watching, um, I'm gonna continue. If you're asking, I'm gonna continue to do Muskwatch. Um, I have a lot of fun doing Muskwatch with uh, my good friend and colleague Dan Casey. He is one of the sharpest, uh, wittiest, um, and smartest people that I know and play, being able to play off of him. I'm not, I try to be silly and because science, I, I want it to be more accessible. I'm just, I'm just a guy who wants to learn these things with you. Um, but what Dan is great at is rapid fire thinking on your feet and improv, um, which is a lot. If you couldn't tell, it's a lot of what we do on. So being able to practice that, so to speak with him every week, um, and with everyone who makes that show, some of them are in the comments. Um, it's a real, it's it's a real treat. It's it's a lot of fun, um, and I don't have to write it, which is great. If Elon offered me a job, would I take it? Loaded question. I don't. I can't take it. But if he, <laughs> not right now. But if he if he asked me if I wanted to do anything, I would find a way to make it work. If he, if he came to me and says, hey, dude, would you like to produce a SpaceX video? Heck yeah, let's do it. I think he has good intentions at heart. I think at the bottom, he wants to increase public understanding of science and interest in science and space travel. That's what I'm trying to do, except not, I can't land two rockets at once, although I have an idea of how they do it. It's physics. Um, what is my favorite Borderlands game? I missed it. I like number two. The writing is great. Um, how do I animate my videos? That is complicated and that is a behind the scenes question. Um, and I have a, a really good editor. Uh, I wish I should learn how to do it half as good as he does and, I, and I'd be good off. Uh, can I be your buddy? Every Friday, man. Every Friday. So um, if you're just joining us, uh, this is Because Science Live. This is going to be a reoccurring thing that we're going to do. Although for the first one, I'm unfortunately traveling. So I have to do it from a hotel room. But going forward, we want to do uh, Because Science Live, where I try to answer your questions live on set uh, every Friday afternoon. Um, afternoon Los Angeles time, PST. Uh, so we're going to be doing that every week. So it's going to be Tuesday vlog goes out where I take your questions and talk to you and talk about other stuff that's on my mind. Thursday, new episode, Friday, live stream. I want it to be a, a whole a swath of content to keep you satiated in terms of your science. Um, <laughs> there's, there's questions that I want to answer, but I can. <laughs> um, well, going too fast. Have I, ever, have I ever thought about doing a collab with MatPat of Game Theory? Interesting that you should say that. Uh, okay. Are you interested in debunking pseudoscience? Um, interesting question, because when I started out in science communication, actually, that's what I was doing. I was working for an educational foundation and other organizations where it was their mission to provide information about pseudoscience and the paranormal and cryptozoology, weird things, ghost goblins, Bigfoot. That's what I started doing. Um, but as I was doing it, I realized how easy it is to be unintentionally confrontational. And when you, when you explain or try to explain why a belief is not plausible, people can wrap their emotions inside of those beliefs. And it's very easy to just come off wrong or, or, or not say the right thing or um, be unintentionally confrontational, like I said. So I transitioned into doing more general science communication because no matter my own opinions about anything, I want to be as accessible as possible and hopefully excite or interest people about science generally. And then if I can do that, my hope is, is that you can apply scientific principles, scientific thinking to the rest of your life. And that would extend to other beliefs that you may 
hold. So I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong unless it's something that directly impacts public health or is a or is a health hazard. Like, get vaccinated, get your flu shot. Uh, evolution happens. Uh, I think those things impact the public disproportionately. Um, but uh, I'm not one to, you know, rain on a, a a parade if it's not impacting my life directly. So I, I switched to more general science communication stuff because I want to be accessible and I, and I don't want to be the guy who just makes people angry on purpose. That's no fun to me. Debunking isn't really what I like doing. Uh, and with these episodes, I try to give the universe the benefit of the doubt, bend the universe, but don't break it. I don't want to say, oh, that cool thing that you're excited about in that film or video game or book or TV show, that's not possible. That's dumb. Mm, that's not my bag. Let's see how it might work. Or what would be cool if it really worked. That, that's, that's what I'm doing. Am I ambidextrous? No. Pay close attention and you'll see which my dominant hand, which one is my dominant hand. You'll, you'll be able to see. Um, what is the most plausible superpower that exists? Oh, I don't know. It would be probably something closer to superhuman stamina, something like that where you have higher blood uh, blood oxygen levels or your muscles function at a higher level, but it's not going to be so above and beyond that I don't think you'd be a super superhero. Otherwise, with, you know, billions of people on the planet, we would have seen someone like that who is, you know, able to Jessica Jones up on top, you know, up to the top of a building. Um so, how many years before the Earth burns up, Aaron asks again. Uh, about five billion years, but, but uh, the sun is going to exhaust its fuel at the center, and it's going to have to increase um, to, to keep itself together. And one, once that does, Earth is going to be here, and it's going to... And then we're done. Uh, how was working with Bill Nye on Bill Nye Saves the World? Yeah, I was on, I did a quick 90 minute seg, 90 minute, a 90 second segment on Bill Nye Saves the World season two, the episode about time travel. It was cool. Um, I didn't actually interact with Bill on stage. Uh, they threw to my segment. Um, and, uh, but it, it was great. They were very receptive to my idea. I wrote that script and I, and I did all the producing on that and they made it happen. And it's, it's great. I've met Bill a number of times now, and uh, yeah, he, he's definitely someone who got me interested in science. And, and um, another thing, you know, about I don't want to be too self congratulatory about this, but I kind of have a new driving force in my life. Uh, seriously, um, I was on stage with Bill Nye introducing his documentary about his life that was made, and. Um, Someone asked, I asked about legacy. Someone else asked about his impact and what, you know, what's next. And he looked at me and he said, you know, people like you, Kyle, you're it, man. I'm passing you the torch. Don't screw this up. I take that more seriously than I take anything. I'm not going to screw this up, which is why we have our channel and which is why we're all going to learn together and we're going to do nerdy stuff and we have about a minute and I hope you've been enjoying everything we've done uh, so far over the... 175-ish episodes. There's going to be a lot more to come um, because science is now going to be three times a week across various formats. Um, and I'm not going to screw it up. I'm going to try not to. I'm going to take I'm going to take a torch and run with it. It's not going to be just me. There's a ton of awesome people doing great work like me, um, especially on YouTube. But I'm going to do my best uh, to keep interesting, interesting, in, I'm going to try to interest you <laughs> in things. I'm going to try to entertain you and uh, I hope that you will uh, give me your feedback and you know, tag along. Maybe we can learn something interesting. <laughs>